Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today I thought, hey, you know, we've covered the tumult in Washington and all the issues that have been facing the United States in this election. And last year, we covered a lot of antitrust conversations and antitrust lawsuits. What if, what if we made a video that combined the two? And thankfully, looking at the news all of this last week, Big Tech was helpful enough to provide me with just such a lawsuit. So on your screen right now, you see a picture of a man holding a phone called Parler, or more specifically with an app called Parler. And if you aren't familiar with this service, it was apparently, and I use the past tense here uh, because it is presently inoperational, uh, it was a competitor to Twitter uh, and to other social media platforms uh, that purported to not have the same kind of rules uh, placed upon it in terms of moderation and things uh, that the Twitters of the world did. And it is, in fact, that lack of moderation, that very mindset that apparently got it into trouble after some of the political things that we saw last week. So if you didn't know, last week, Twitter banned President Donald Trump. Really, I think it was late on Friday after the news cycle on Friday. And at that same time, basically everybody else uh, started to move against various things that were associated uh, with the Trump presidency, with MAGA in general, uh, and with other things that were looked fairly negatively and justifiably so after the events in the Capitol. Uh, and that included Apple and Google kicking off this social network, which was deemed to be effectively conservative and pro-Trump. And more importantly, and more unusually really, Amazon, through their Amazon Web Services, a cloud computing provider, kicking Parler off of their use of services, which effectively ends the ability of the service to function at all, unlike Apple and Google that kick their things off the store. We've talked about this in respect of Epic, and, and that isn't necessarily great if you want to get access to that application, but it also doesn't end the existence of the application itself, whereas if you're kicked off of a computing platform that you use as a foundational uh, blueprint for your application, that does have the effect of effectively being existential. You're gone. You're done. Uh, and so Parler has faced this and ultimately wound up facing it by issuing a lawsuit. Or as Ars Technica says here, Parler goes dark, sues Amazon to demand immediate reinstatement. Bereft of other options, Parler is trying to petition the courts for resurrection. And as we do here in virtual legality, we have the lawsuit to look through, to analyze, and ask the fundamental question, does this tiny nascent social media startup that maybe wasn't so tiny after President Trump was banned from Twitter, especially as we will see as part of the discussion in this lawsuit, does this smaller company have a chance against one of the bigger companies in the world, which is, as we've discussed in virtual legality, very well resourced, has a bunch of lawyers to throw at this thing, and does Parler's argument hold water in any event? Now, before we get started looking at the lawsuit and the language that Parler uses specifically, I do want to point out a few things. There are obviously a lot of passions about all of these things in my channel alone, let alone the rest of the internet. I want to get a few things out here. First, we're going to be looking at the lawsuit and really analyzing it from a legal perspective to determine whether we think Parler has an argument or not. Second, while this might be a freedom of speech adjacent issue as a philosophy that you want to see companies like Parler or like Gab or like Rumble or like anything else that might be a competitor to the social media companies succeed and to allow more speech, it is not a First Amendment issue. It's not a legal issue in that type. The First Amendment only prevents the government from passing a law to do bad things to you if you say the wrong things. The government can't do that, most specifically Congress and the Constitution itself, though that has been adopted against the states and their laws as well. So you might have thoughts as to whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, how you feel about hate speech or freedom of speech. That is all well and good, and we will see that that is rhetorically a part of the argument that Parler brings in this lawsuit. It is not a terribly effective legal argument. And I think folks, especially if they're new to virtual legality, often struggle with that concept. I can analyze something and tell you that it's legal or it's illegal or that I think it is one or the other and still say I disagree with that outcome or that the big tech giants, as is the case here, should really be thinking carefully about the steps they are taking because it is a very regulatory environment with a lot of congressional actors that want to do bad things to big tech and the internet overall. I can say all those things and still tell you that, you know, maybe Amazon had 
every right to do what it did here because they're a private company. They're a private organization and can do these things. I suppose the last disclaimer, since I get this comment a lot, is to note that being publicly traded, being owned by a lot of private citizens, doesn't make your company non-private for purposes of a conversation like this one. The distinction in law for these purposes is, are you private or are you government? So even an Amazon, even another large entity that has publicly traded shares like Twitter is still private in this paradigm when we compare it to government actions. So just because it's publicly owned doesn't mean it's the government for purposes of things like the First Amendment. Now, that's the introduction to this video. I am sure I will already receive 10 comments about how I didn't get started with the substance fast enough. That's why I put chapters in, people. Feel free to skip intros in the future. I think these are foundational and important pieces of the conversation, but you can skip it if you just want to get into the meat of the documents. With that all said, let's talk about Parler versus Amazon Web Services, Inc. The nature of the action is a civil action for injunctive relief, including a temporary restraining order and preliminary injunctive relief. Oh, and damages. We'd like money too, if we can get it. Last month, Defendant Amazon Web Services, Inc. and the popular social media platform Twitter signed a multi-year deal so that AWS could support the daily delivery of millions of tweets. Bit of a non sequitur there, right? We're talking about your action against Amazon. And the first sentence of substance you have is, oh, Amazon signed a deal with Twitter. That kind of sets the framework for what Parler wants you to take away from this. You should be thinking of Amazon as an antitrust violator of restraining trade, working with Twitter, really coalescing around a trust that is designed to hurt us, Parler, and to keep us off the internet. They don't even start with their own complaint. They start with this statement about Amazon and Twitter. AWS currently provides that same service to Parler, a conservative microblogging alternative and competitor to Twitter. So we see the overall state of play here. They really want injunctive relief, which is what? From a legal perspective, that's asking the court to do something, to order a party to do something, rather than to just get a check in the mail. So what do they ultimately want? They want to have access to Amazon Web Services back. They wrote the code for their services based on AWS. They want at least a window of time that they can operate on AWS, even if they have to transition. And they want to court to order Amazon to give it to them. That's the purpose of this action. And if they can get damages, well, they'd like those too. When Twitter announced two evenings ago that it was permanently banning President Trump from its platform, conservative users began to flee Twitter en masse for Parler. Yet, Last evening, AWS announced that it would suspend Parler's account effective Sunday, January 10th, and it stated the reason for the suspension was that AWS was not confident Parler could properly police its platform regarding content that encourages or incites violence against others. Okay, so let's stop there for just a second, and we can actually see the letter that Amazon sent to Parler. Why? Because it seems pretty apparent, I think Parler has the right of it when they describe it in their lawsuit, that Amazon itself or somebody at Amazon leaked it to BuzzFeed directly. And so BuzzFeed has this letter and we can read it in its entirety. Dear Amy, thank you for speaking with us earlier today. As we discussed on the phone yesterday and this morning, we remain troubled by the repeated violation of our terms of service. Over the past several weeks, we've reported 98 examples to Parler of posts that clearly encourage and incite violence. Recently, we've seen a steady increase in this violent content on your website, all of which violates our terms. It's clear that Parler does not have an effective process to comply with the AWS terms of service. And we're going to get back to those terms of service in just a second. It also seems that Parler is still trying to determine its position on content moderation. You remove some violent content when contacted by us or others, but not always with urgency. Your CEO recently stated publicly that he doesn't feel responsible for any of this, and neither should the platform. This morning, you shared that you have a plan to more proactively moderate violent content, but plan to do so manually with volunteers. It's our view that this nascent plan to use volunteers to promptly identify and remove dangerous content will not work in light of the rapidly growing number of violent posts. This is further demonstrated by the fact that you still, not, still have not taken down much of the content that we have sent to you. Given the unfortunate events that transpired this past week in Washington, D.C., there is a serious risk that this type of content will further incite violence. AWS provides technology and services to customers across the political spectrum, and we continue to respect Parler's right to determine for itself what content it will allow on its site. However, we cannot provide services to a customer that is unable to effectively identify and remove content that encourages or incites violence against others. 
because Parler cannot comply with our terms of service and poses a very real risk to public safety, we plan to suspend Parler's account effective Sunday, January 10th at 1159 p.m. We will ensure that all of your data is preserved for you to migrate to your own servers and we'll work with you as best we can to help your migration. We're, we're kicking you off the service. And I think Parler will rightly say that's what this is. Amazon doesn't want ha- to have anything to do with them. And Parler will also bring up in their lawsuit, as we will see, instances where they feel that this is pretextual. That is a fancy legal way of saying that Amazon is lying. Uh, and they do that by saying, hey, you know, 98 posts, Twitter has all these other posts, Facebook has all these other posts, what are you talking about? And you say, we don't do it with urgency, and we didn't cover it adequately, and you don't think it'll work, uh, and you're trying to mandate certain moderation. And to some extent, that's accurate. To some extent, Parler is right to say that maybe Amazon isn't treating everybody equally, and that's why they frame their lawsuit to begin with as affecting Twitter, that Amazon and Twitter are effectively in legal bed together. And Parler wants to point that out to the court to try to establish improper motivations for what Amazon is doing. That word improper is important, as we will see, because they're going to base a lot of their argument on the nature of Amazon acting in an untoward and hopefully, from Parler's perspective, illegal way. Now, one thing I also want to point out is that this is interesting given a lot of the discussions around all of this happening right now, right? So Parler right now is bringing up a claim about effectively antitrust concerns, that they have an issue with Amazon because they are a monopoly, they're working with Twitter, they are effectively a trust, they're working to keep Parler down, and that's an important thing for the court to know. Why is that important? Not necessarily from a legal perspective so much, though we will see an antitrust complaint, but because of the nature of the regulatory environment. We covered this report last year in a video we did in our Epic series, but it was a report from the House of Representatives that talked about various big tech giants acting as monopolists and potentially in violation of antitrust, including this report going so far as to suggest that maybe these companies should be broken up. Now, we reviewed this report and I have my issues with what the findings are, and it's not indicative of what Congress will do on the whole. It's a subcommittee of another committee in one House of Congress. But it is important to note that they have found Amazon and more particularly Amazon Web Services to be problematic already. Or as this report says, the leading position AWS enjoys in the market traces in part to its first mover advantage, which is okay. They went first. Network effects and steep investments that the company made in building out the physical infrastructure on which cloud resides. That's the sentence that says, all this stuff is good. We want that. However, AWS has also engaged in a series of business practices designed to maintain its market dominance at the expense of choice and innovation through a combination of self-preferencing, misappropriation, and degradation of interoperability Amazon has sought to eliminate cross-platform products with Amazon-only products. Amazon's conduct has already led several open-source projects to become more closed, a move driven by a need for protection from Amazon misappropriation. And if unchecked, Amazon's tactics over the long-term risk-solidifying lock-in and diminishing the incentive to invest. Because cloud is the core infrastructure on which the digital economy runs, ensuring its openness and competitiveness is paramount. And I think that's right. I think that cloud services are much more infrastructural, much more utility oriented than things like the App Store uh, or even the Google Play Store that also kicked Parler off. And we'll see Parler basically agree to that supposition as part of their lawsuit. And because they are more utility like in nature, Amazon is probably more susceptible to a complaint here than the apples of the world with respect to the Epic case. Doesn't mean I think that this is a winner, and we'll talk about that as we continue to go along with this lawsuit, but that what Amazon is providing is supposed to be a more neutral pipeline than even the App Store or the Google Play Store that we've talked about so frequently on this site. Continuing with their lawsuit, we're almost out of page two, guys. However, Friday night, one of the top trending tweets on Twitter was hang Mike Pence, but AWS has no plans, nor has it made any threats to suspend Twitter's account. So again, we finish off the first page of this complaint with a focus from Parler on what Twitter is doing wrong. And I understand the politics here. I understand the rhetoric here. I understand why this makes sense to be reported on, that reporters will pick this up, that journalists will pick this up, and that it's still maybe useful as a marketing initiative from Parler. But from a legal perspective, 
for the most part, this doesn't mean a whole lot. If you don't give them the full credit that they want in that opening sentence that says, well, Amazon is with Twitter, and so they're doing this because they're acting in in lockstep and they're acting together. If you don't already agree with that premise, then what this winds up looking like is, but officer, the car next to me was going faster and speeding more. Or the two kids talking to their mom and said, but Jimmy did it first and he hit me and it was worse. And it doesn't matter from a legal perspective. If we're talking about an Amazon company and Amazon Web Services that has a contractual right to do what it's doing, and we'll get to that, then ultimately the fact that it chooses not to invoke that same right against another similar, similarly situated person like a Twitter isn't in and of itself illegal, especially if they can justify that from a business perspective, which is what they are trying to do. Continuing with the lawsuit, AWS's decision to effectively terminate Parler's account is apparently motivated by political animus. That isn't a thing. Uh, Motivation of political animus, you're trying to get it to a a place where it's an improper act by Amazon, but in general, your politics are not protected uh, by the Constitution or the law. It's not a protected class. We don't talk about it the same way we talk about uh, age and sex and gender and those kinds of things, race, uh, religion even. Uh, And so political animus isn't really going to get you across the end line either. It is also apparently designed to reduce competition in the microblogging services market to the benefit of Twitter. That, that will get you somewhere. If that is legitimate, if you can prove that, if you could show emails that say, ah, yes, we're twirling our mustaches and we're going to take down Parler to help our friends at Twitter, then you might have a stew going. But this is two sentences kind of back to back, one of which doesn't make a ton of sense, one of which makes some sense, but really lacks getting over that end line. Thus, AWS is violating Section 1 of the Sherman Antitrust Act in combination with defendant Twitter. AWS is also breaching its contract with Parler, which requires AWS to provide Parler with a 30-day notice before terminating service, rather than the less than 30-hour notice AWS actually provided. Finally, AWS is committing intentional interference with prospective economic advantage, given the millions of users expected to sign up in the near future. So those are three complaints, and we will see those as three complaints at the end of this lawsuit. Violation of Sherman, that they are acting in an antitrust violating capacity, as we just talked about, that is a current regulatory question. And if you're interested in more in-depth discussion of the current state of antitrust and big tech, especially with respect to Epic versus Apple versus Google and some of the stuff that was going around last year, please check out this small 27 video uh, playlist that we currently have on Epic versus Apple, which will grow this year in 2021 when that lawsuit between Epic and Apple actually commences. But that's really where our in-depth conversation takes place. I will say for those of you that haven't watched that whole thing, it's important to note that when we talk about Sherman, it's written very broadly. Every contract combination in the form of trust or otherwise or conspiracy in in restraint of trade is declared to be illegal. But the courts have since the passage of this act said, whoa, that's way too broad. And in fact, if you go and you look at some summaries here, Long ago, the Supreme Court decided that the Sherman Act does not prohibit every restraint of trade, only those that are quote-unquote unreasonable. For instance, in some sense, an agreement between two individuals to form a partnership restrains trade. Of course it does. They can't do something else that they would otherwise be allowed to do, but may not do so unreasonably and thus may be lawful under the antitrust laws. More specifically, if you have a business justification for what you are doing, that is mostly going to be okay even if you are a monopolist, even if you have monopoly power. And Amazon Web Services, if you go and you look at that House report, is suggested as having very high levels of power in their market. If they have a legitimate business justification for behaving in a way that prevents other firms from succeeding in the marketplace, that's mostly going to be okay. So if Amazon can turn to Parler and say, look, Twitter might be bad. Twitter might have all this stuff. But we can see when something happens at Twitter that they do bans and they try things. And so we have this legitimate business justification. That's going to be an affirmative defense to an antitrust claim. Doesn't mean that Parler can't bring it. Doesn't mean even that they couldn't win at the end of the day because antitrust is such a nebulous area of law, especially as applied to these big technology giants. It does, however, mean it's a difficult road to hoe. So continuing with the lawsuit, We see that the next two parts are the breach of contract, which we're going to look at, and the intentional interference with prospective economic advantage, which we will also look at, but which isn't terribly well presented as part of this lawsuit. 
we go through the jurisdiction. This is a federal case. Uh, Parler is a Nevada company, which was deemed to be by itself the solution to problems that have surfaced in recent years due to changes in big tech policy influenced by various special interest groups. And look, I'm here in virtual reality. I'm on YouTube. I've analyzed terms of service at Twitter, at Facebook, at YouTube. I've complained about things like COPPA and how YouTube has thrown its creators under the bus and different things about ambiguities in Twitter rules and Facebook rules. I understand the desire to get away from some of these companies. I hope that there are 20 new companies that start up with various different degrees of what it is they can and can't do. And to be honest with you, I'm not thrilled when the infrastructure companies like the Amazon Web Services or some of the payment processors start getting into these things and saying, well, this isn't uh, political enough. This doesn't match my messaging enough. But this might be of a different kind, and we'll take a look at that as well. AWS is the world's leading cloud service providers, capturing a third of the global market. Millions of customers, including the fastest growing startups, largest enterprise, and leading government agencies, trust AWS to power their infrastructure, become more agile, and lower costs. That's from Amazon itself, quoted here in this lawsuit. And in short, AWS is the Rolls Royce of cloud platform providers. Interesting choice. It's always fun when you're reading these metaphors or analogies in a lawsuit. What do you use to establish what really means uh, top of the line? Here, Parler has gone with Rolls Royce. Does that say anything about them? I don't know. I don't know what I, that I would have gone with Rolls Royce, but we shall continue. Parler contracts with AWS to provide the cloud computing services Parler needs for its apps and website to function on the internet. Further, that both the apps and the website are written to work with AWS technology. To have to switch to a different service provider would require rewriting that code, meaning Parler will be offline for a financially devastating period. And I don't think Parler is wrong in that capacity. I think that they are right, that these actions that were taken very quickly together with Apple and Google and Facebook all acting together very quickly, and all companies that are actually named in this report, if you go and look at it, these are the big tech giants that the House and Congress in general are specifically concerned with. And I do think it's going to cripple Parler. I think they're going to have trouble coming back from it. I don't know that they will get other networking services once all these big companies have spoken against you. It's often difficult to get that traction back. Less than a month ago, AWS announced with a press release a new multi-year deal with Twitter. We saw that in the first sentence. Further, this expansion onto AWS marks the first time that Twitter is leveraging the public cloud to scale their real-time service. This deal built on the company's more than decade-long collaboration, where AWS continues to provide Twitter with storage, compute, or compute, I guess, database, and content delivery services to support its distribution of images, videos, and ad content. So that's true. I mean, we have no reason to believe it's not true, but it also raises a question that a judge would ask or that anybody else would ask, which is, okay, if, if they've been in business with Twitter for more than a decade and they were okay with you on their service until a week ago, what changed? And it might be that you can make the case that it's all politics and that everything changed when everybody swept against Donald Trump and that Reddit moved and I think Spotify moved and Pinterest. I didn't know even that President Trump had a Pinterest account. I think they moved at the same time. And reasonable people can look at that and say, wow, that's a lot of power in the hands of those folks. In fact, this first article that I used to highlight this from the New York Times, hardly a bastion of conservative political philosophy, really has a couple of opinion pieces in that paper that say, yeah, you know, we don't necessarily like those folks, but wow, they moved fast and strong against these things. And, you know, that could be turned on us or, or that could cause other harms to the Republic. I don't, I don't think that's wrong, but we're talking about legality, and I think this Parler lawsuit has some holes in it, as we are seeing. At the same time, Parler began to significantly increase its usership at the expense of Twitter. So the story Parler is telling, Amazon has formed a contractual relationship, really gotten on the boat and sailed out to sea with Twitter, and then Twitter started having lapses and losing traction because of some of the actions that were they were taking. They quote some articles here. Fact checked on Facebook and Twitter. Conservatives switched their apps. Parler, a conservative Twitter clone, has seen nearly 1 million downloads since election, etc., etc. This resulted in Parler rocketing to be the number one free app in the iOS app store, up from over a thousandth just a week earlier. So this really was a moment that Parler as a company was taking advantage of. 
In 2021, this trend not only continued, it accelerated thanks to Twitter's announcement two days ago that it would permanently ban President Trump from its platform. Speculation began to mount that President Trump would likewise move to Parler. Given the close to 90 million followers the president had on Twitter, this would be an astronomical boon to par- Parley. It's a, it's a misspelling. Lawyers, you know, we're humans. And a heavy blow to Twitter. Given the context of Parler's looming threat to Twitter, AWS moved to shut down Parler. So this whole story here really goes to damages, really goes to Amazon knew we were growing. Amazon thought we were growing at the expense of a partner that it held dear and that was going to make Amazon a lot of money. And so they took these steps to hurt us to the advantage of Twitter. Now, some of the problems with this argument are, of course, that those other big tech giants moved all at once. Right, That's a problem in and of itself if you want to bring a lawsuit against all of them as some kind of big tech trust. But if you're not going to do that, one of the arguments is, okay, so you say Amazon did this out of spite because they're invested in Twitter. Is Google invested in Twitter? How, how does Apple relate to all of this? Did anybody else come up against Parler? How did they relate? Not saying there aren't good answers to that if you're Parler's counsel or CEO. I'm saying they're not presented in this lawsuit. And these are the kinds of questions that a judge or just the other side will wind up asking in a counter notice or maybe even counter lawsuit. Continuing, yesterday evening at 6.07 Pacific time, web news site BuzzFeed posted an article with screenshots of a letter from Amazon Web Services to Parler. That's the one that we read. Strangely, the article with the letter was posted before Parler received the letter in an email received at 7.19 Pacific over an hour after the BuzzFeed article went online, meaning Amazon leaked the letter to BuzzFeed before sending it to Parler. I have to admit, it does seem that way. And when you're talking about these kinds of things, those bad acts, those sneaky little bits do come up in lawsuit land, right? If you weren't a part of watching us talk about Epic versus Apple, one of the things you might not know is what we're talking about here is this temporary restraining order, preliminary injunction. They want to make Amazon keep them on the service for at least a period of time. And this gets evaluated by the court in the following ways. Are you likely to win the overall court case? If you are, then we are more inclined to give you your injunction early before we've adjudicated the whole claim because you might otherwise be harmed. That second bullet is what's important about that calculation. If we don't do this, if we don't give you the right to be on the Amazon Web Services right now, will you be irreparably harmed? So the pages and pages and pages of discussion that we just looked at saying that people are going to be kicked off uh, of Parler. They're going to find other places. We were just growing. We were number one. They kicked off Trump and everybody was going to come to us. This was our day in the sun. And then Amazon struck is trying to de- design to show not just that they acted improperly, not just that they had advantage with Twitter, but also that this company, Parler, would have that irreparable harm. Balance of the equities comes out to be, well, okay, Amazon had the contractual right to do this, but was it improper? And were they acting against what their contract really should be doing? That's where you get into the kind of, well, they don't treat Twitter the same way as they treated us kind of question. It's a very amorphous kind of standard for this part of the injunction. And then public interest. Would the public be better off with Parler available or not? And in general, outside of what we're going to talk about, which is, you know, statements of violence and things that Amazon has identified, if those weren't a part of any of this, and this was just purely political, then this would be a much better argument for Parler because the public interest in general by the courts is going to be seen as freedom of speech and discourse and having more apps rather than less. And if Amazon doesn't have a good reason, then maybe if there is a likelihood of winning, which I think is a little bit tough to claim on the parlor side, and they'd be irreparably harmed and the public interest would be well advised to have this app available to it, maybe you get that injunction. But that likelihood of winning is going to be a real problem for parlor. Continuing with their lawsuit, This death blow by AWS could not come at a worse time for Parler, a time when the company is surging with the potential of even more explosive growth in the next few days. Without AWS, Parler is finished as it has no way to get online. Now, I don't know whether that's hyperbole or not. There are other service providers, but here we see the the main footnote that was included in the Parler lawsuit that separates Amazon from Google and Apple. Because one question you might ask is, okay, if this all happened, why aren't you suing Google and Apple? And they say AWS indefinitely suspending Parler's account is categorically different than Google or Apple dropping Parler from their app stores. In the instance of the latter, 
Existing Parler users can still use its app. It's just harder for Parler to sign up new users. But with AWS's move, both existing users and new users are completely prevented from using the app until Parler can find some other service to replace AWS. Users are also prevented from using Parler's website, which is likewise dependent upon AWS. This kills the whole thing. This is an infrastructural component of our product. And so, Court, you should be taking this more seriously. And it's also why we didn't bring a complaint against Google and Apple, which would have been a complaint similar to the one that Epic brought if they had decided to do it, Parler had. So they decided not to go down that road, not to go down the Epic road that says Apple, just by nature of kicking things off of its store, is monopolistic and evil. Parler doesn't want to bring that argument. Uh, and I think primarily that's because Parler's philosophy is not suggestive of that argument. Parler's rival social media apps such as conservative-oriented Gab or conservative media Rumble are also experiencing record growth right now, which again brings back that question. Do either of those use Amazon Web Services? And if they do, isn't that a pretty strong argument that Amazon is doing something against you, Parler specifically, for something it has a problem with you about if it allows Gab or Rumble on its service? Now, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know whether either of those use web services at all, whether they're cloud-oriented. I don't know. Gab or Rumble or Parler. So I apologize for not having the on the ground experience with these applications, but it's certainly something that would be raised if either of those used Amazon Web Services. And by silencing Parler, AWS silences the millions of Parler users who do not feel their free speech is protected by Twitter or other social media apps. Again, rhetorical, political, potentially strong if you are amenable to the message, legally nothing. Amazon doesn't have a duty or obligation to provide your users with something. They have an obligation to whatever they agreed to by contract, and we will see whether or not they violated that. Parler thinks that they did, but they don't have an obligation to advantage free speech. They don't have an obligation to help the millions of Parler users who do not feel their free speech is protected. Where this particular paragraph comes in, I believe, is with respect to that injunction kind of concept. You're trying to establish public interest right here, even if you aren't combining it in the way I would expect in a lawsuit of this type. What is more, by pulling the plug on Parler but leaving Twitter alone, despite identical conduct by users on both sides, AWS reveals that its expressed reasons for suspending Parler's account are but pretext. In its note announcing the pending termination of Parler's service, AWS alleged that over the past several weeks, we've reported 98 examples to Parler of posts that clearly encourage and incite violence. AWS provides a few examples, including one that stated, how about make them hang, followed by a series of hashtags, including F.U. Mike Pence. AWS further stated to Parler that the violent content on your website violates our terms because AWS declared we cannot provide services to a customer that is unable to effectively identify and remove content that encourages or incites violence against others. AWS announced the pending termination of Parler's account. However, the day before on Friday, one of the top trends on Twitter was Hang Mike Pence with over 14,000 tweets. And earlier last week, a Los Angeles Times columnist observed that Twitter and other social media platforms are partly culpable for the Capitol Hill riot. Now, here you get a real disconnect between Parler's marketing and what it wants to put itself out as and what it actually has to claim as part of this lawsuit. Right, so they're trying to establish that Amazon is treating Twitter differently and that Twitter and Facebook and others were responsible for the riot. They say, look at all these articles and the actual LA Times article that they cite refers back to this USA Today article that I'm bringing up right now. They say there were calls from Boogaloo's, an extremist group, to burn down D.C. One person asked on Twitter, who's running arms and ammo to D.C. for when the fun starts? This continues with things like on Twitter between January 1st and January 6th, 1,480 posts from QAnon-related accounts referenced January 6th and contained violent terms or threats, including calls for patriots to rise up, kick the tires and light the fires, etc., etc., etc. So now what you have to look at is from Parler, who claims to be the free speech application here, effectively having to say, well, look, they were responsible too, which anybody from a third party like me looking at this says, okay, isn't the right answer to that from the way that you are framing this is that you're asking for more censorship? You think Amazon should also kick Twitter off? And that's always a difficulty when you're having these kinds of conversations. It's just the same as when you were having that conversation. If you're two kids talking to the mom and you say, Jimmy did it worse, you still get, all right, well, I'll punish you both. It's like, no, no, that's not, that's not exactly what I was looking for. I was trying to not get punished myself. But again, you look at what Amazon is talking about and Amazon can say, hey, yeah, okay, Twitter had all this bad stuff on there, 
But Twitter takes these steps. I pulled up a Verge article that says Twitter bans 70,000 QAnon accounts as conservatives report lost followers following the riot at the Capitol, which would appear to be effectively responsive to this complaint that Twitter is going to try to get rid of these things. And Amazon is saying that Parler won't be doing those things and is going to rely on voluntary uh, moderation and things along those lines. Parler can have its position and say, no, we don't want to have to do that. And Amazon can say, well, we want you to have to do that. And here we are stuck. So yes, they're complaining that Twitter is being treated differently. Twitter can say they do things a bit differently. And then Amazon has its business justification and we start to lose all of the grounding we have for this lawsuit if we're Parler. AWS knew its allegations contained in the letter it leaked to the press that Parler was not able to find and remove content that encouraged violence was false because over the last few days, Parler had removed everything AWS had brought to its attention and more, yet AWS sought to defame Parler nonetheless. Now, here we get one of our big disconnects, right? So if you actually go and you read this letter, you say you remove some of the uh, violent content, but not always with urgency. You don't always remove everything that we ask for. We cannot provide services to a customer that is unable to effectively identify and remove content. And so you actually have a dispute of facts here, which is useful for a lawsuit uh, because that can be at least settled. But Amazon says you didn't take everything down. Parler says we did take everything down. And Parler is going to say because of that, there wasn't a breach of contract. And we will see whether or not that is in fact important. So first count that they bring is what we talked about before, the Sherman Antitrust Act. That is, they have enacted an illegal restraint of trade. Now, they actually try to say it's a restraint of trade with Twitter without joining Twitter to the lawsuit, which is an interesting move. Less than a month ago, Amazon Web Services and Parler's competitor Twitter entered into a multi-year deal. Late Friday evening, Twitter banned President Trump from using its platform, thereby driving enormous numbers of its users to Parler. 24 hours later, Amazon Web Services announced it would indefinitely suspend Parler's account. Amazon Web Services' reasons for doing so are not consistent with its treatment of Twitter, indicating a desire to harm Parler. Okay. By suspending Parler's account, AWS will remove from the market a surging player severely restraining commerce in the microblogging services market, and as such, they violate the Sherman Antitrust Act. But just like with Epic versus Apple, just like with that playlist, What we've got here is a contractual relationship between these parties. This isn't some third party that's controlling the price of oil and you can't get it cheaply enough and they're hurting competitors and things like that. You've actually entered into a contract with Amazon. And when Amazon follows the terms of its contract, if it did so, in general, you have pre-agreed to the rights that you have against them and to the rights that they have against you in a fashion that in general belies this kind of legal action. Doesn't mean they couldn't win it. If the stars aligned, it does mean it's an extraordinarily weak case to bring on the part of Parler against Amazon, made more problematic because Amazon's well-resourced and is going to have lawyers, and as we will see, has some contract terms that they can use against Parler itself. The second count, breach of contract, is what we're going to dive into a lot at this point in the video. AWS breached its contract with Parler by not providing 30 days notice before terminating its account. Now, when I first saw this, when I was reading through this lawsuit, initially I said, okay, That's a real argument. The Sherman Antitrust Act, maybe not so much. The intentional interference with contractual relations, maybe not so much. But if there are black and white words on a page that says Amazon has to do X, Y, and Z, and they ignored those in order to do what they are doing here, that's the kind of breach that is explicit and wrongful and can get you a temporary restraining order that at bare minimum says, okay, they had to give you 30 days. So now we'll give you the 30 days. Under Washington law, a breach of contract is actionable only if the contract imposes a duty, the duty is breached, and the breach approximately causes damage to the claimant. The AWS customer agreement with Parler allows either party to terminate the agreement for cause if the other party is in material breach of this agreement and the material breach remains uncured for a period of 30 days from receipt of notice by the other party. A lot of legal language there, but ultimately it means, okay, we give you notice that you're in breach in some fashion and you have 30 days to fix it, to cure it under the law. And if you don't, we can terminate you. And if you do, we can't. So it's designed to give this notification window period to allow the folks on AWS to fix what is necessary. Because as we've talked about, this is a very important service. You're probably building your entire livelihood around this third party service functioning properly. And so it would be normal to ask for a period like this. On January 8th, 2021, AWS brought concerns to Parler about user content that encouraged violence. Parler addressed them, and then AWS said it was okay 
with Parler. I would love to see what exactly that was. It sounds like an email that maybe just had the word okay in it. The next day, however, after they received that okay, AWS brought more bad content to Parler and Parler took down all of that content by the evening. Thus, there was no uncured material breach of the agreement for 30 days as required for termination. Further, while AWS used the term suspension in quotes in its notice to Parler, it stated that it would ensure that all of your data is preserved for you to migrate. This is not action AWS would take for a temporary suspension, but rather from a permanent termination. I agree with that, that Amazon is clearly setting up for an actual termination. They don't give you all that migration stuff uh, if they aren't planning on terminating your agreement. Thus, AWS will have breached its contract with and harmed Parler. Further, lost future profits in this case are difficult to calculate due to the rapidly increasing nature of Parler's user base, et cetera, et cetera. We are entitled to injunctive relief and maybe damages, but you don't actually ask for them here. It gets weird in this part of the lawsuit. So I looked at this and I said, okay, yeah, that's the kind of thing that would be a legitimate complaint and a legitimate way to go to get a temporary restraining order. But we still have to look at the customer agreement. And thankfully for us and all of you in virtual legality, that customer agreement is available for all to see. Now, one thing I will note as we go through these sections and we see why this is probably a loser for Parler is that it was last updated November 30th, 2020. Now, I'm not going to scroll all the way to the bottom of this agreement to show you, but they have basically said we reserve the right to change it as long as we give you 90 days notice of that change. So one of the things you have to do to make sure when you are reading these kinds of things is to make sure that the change doesn't impact your analysis. And we can see that the last two changes, October 30th and November 30th, might not be operable depending on what Parler was doing. They were probably using the services for these time, but if we give them the maximum benefit of the doubt, the last updated version of this agreement that could count against Parler is June 30th, 2020. And if you look at this page that Amazon helpfully provides, you see that the last two changes were really just about uh, Brazilian contracting parties and South Korean contracting parties and were additions to the contract. So everything that we can look at is basically going to be viable for purposes of this analysis, which is good news. But that process of figuring out what date of contract actually applies to the lawsuit or other dispute you're looking at, very necessary. So if you're in law school, if you're a lawyer otherwise, or if you're just interested in these kinds of things, you always have to remember to figure out what the actual agreement looked like at the time it would have been applicable for the dispute. With that out of the way, we can take a look and say, okay, so we've got all these provisions in this contract. What are we worried about? Ooh, Oh, this is interesting. Section six, temporary suspension. Now that sounds exactly like what they said they were doing. They said, okay, we are going to suspend your account. We're not going to terminate the agreement. So now we already know Parler's in a bit of trouble because it's not that Amazon is trying to do something completely separate from what it said it would do. It is instead using a section that is in the document itself to invoke a power that it has every right to. So let's see if that applies here. We may suspend your or any end user's right to access or use any portion or all of the service offerings and service offerings, capital S, capital O, is basically everything they provide as web services immediately upon notice. So no 30-day window. It's immediate. If this is applicable, Amazon can suspend you immediately. If we determine that your or an end user's use of the service offerings is one of the following four categories poses a security risk to the service offerings or any third party. That's a big one. So poses a security risk to the service offerings is generally as a tech lawyer, we would read that as, okay, you're talking about Trojan horses and server attacks and various bad things that Amazon very definitely wants to be able to cut you off immediately on. If we figure out that somebody on your service is using it to attack AWS itself, then we can cut you off. But it's broader than that. We talk about ambiguities all the time in virtual legality. We can use this provision if your or an end user's use of the service poses a security risk to any third party. Does that drag in discussions of violence? Does that drag in statements of that nature? Maybe, but they probably also don't need it. So let's continue on. If the use could adversely impact our systems, the service offerings or the systems or content of any other AWS customer. Again, we're getting more into attacks. Can you cross attack somebody else using AWS? And that bothers us and we will kick you off immediately. Could subject us, our affiliates, or any third party to liability or could be fraudulent. Now, the liability question is interesting and that's where we get the next kind of nexus between what we think of 
as the big tech laws and this lawsuit. This is section 230, CDA 230 is discussed all the time. I think there's like 15 reform bills in every given congressional session now, a lot of which are stupid and at least half of which are written by Senator Hawley. And and we've read through in virtual reality, you can look for either CDA 230 or Hawley or or dumb uh, in a search of my channel to look at the analysis of those proposals. But CDA 230 was fashioned around you not having to worry about what end users did if you are a service provider on the internet. Congress finds the following. The internet and other interactive computer services represent an extraordinary advance in educational and informational resources, offer a forum for a true diversity of political discourse, have flourished with a minimum of government regulation. So it is the policy of the United States to promote development of the internet, to preserve vibrant and competitive free market that presently exists on the internet, to encourage development of technologies which maximize user control, et cetera, et cetera. And how do they do that? With C1, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. Said another way, this is what you hear about as the Section 230 Liability Shield. Amazon is not responsible for what you do on their service. And you are not responsible if you're parlor CEO for what your individual users do on your service. This is the entire kind of pyramid on which the internet is built. That the folks that are providing the utilities, the platforms, the pipelines are not responsible for what forum user XXX decides to say on their service. With a couple of exceptions. So we scroll down a little bit further and here we see the other part of CDA 230, which says that you're allowed to moderate whatever you want if you are a platform holder. And we see that this section doesn't have any effect on criminal laws, right? So this is focused on obscenity. This actual law, CDA 230, Communications Decency Act, was all concerned with pornography on the internet and and children accessing it and children's pornography and all these very bad things. And so you see, and if you look at all these sections, you'll see that referred to obscenity, sexual exploitation of children, et cetera, but also any other federal criminal statute, any intellectual property statute. State law has to basically comply with this, but it gets a little bit ambiguous and dicey from there. No effect on sex trafficking laws, which require certain amounts of moderation and control over your platform. And so What you've got here is you've got an overall shield, which is going to apply in 99% of the cases, but you still have a vested interest in the Amazons of the world, of the other platforms of the world to try to make sure that what their end users are saying doesn't somehow wind up on the criminal law side of things. And a lot of these companies, the Amazons, the YouTubes, the Facebooks of the world, whether or not you agree with the actions that they have taken uh, this last week, find themselves trying to prevent things like violent discussions from happening on their service. So we get, hey, if it subjects us to third-party liability, and reasonably, if we assume that it could, then we can suspend your services upon immediately upon notice. Also, if you're fraudulent, if you're, if you're lying, if you're otherwise acting, again, illegally, if we could potentially be liable for it, then we can kick you off. So overall, they've got a couple of ways that they can say that they can suspend you immediately. If you pose a security risk to a third party, uh, if it subjects us to liability. And here's the big one, 6.1b, if you or an end user is in breach of this agreement. Now, we've looked through a lot of these agreements here in virtual legality, and I can tell you that they're written in such a way that very often you'll be in breach of some kind, right? And so it's no surprise here that Parler is probably in breach, Under section 8, 8 8.2, you represent and warrant to us. Parler promises to us at Amazon that none of your content or your end user's use of your content or the service offerings will violate the acceptable use policy. And then we go and we look at the acceptable use policy and we go and we find the following. You may not use or encourage, promote, facilitate, or instruct others to use the services or AWS site for any illegal, harmful, fraudulent, infringing, or offensive use. Illegal, harmful, fraudulent, infringing, or offensive, with harmful and offensive being some big ones that give Amazon a lot of leeway. Illegal, harmful, or fraudulent activities. Any activities that are illegal, that violate the rights of others, or that may be harmful to others, may be harmful to others, our operations, or reputation, Any activities that might be harmful to Amazon's reputation, maybe the Donald, President Trump has gotten so toxic, especially in the communities in which Amazon rolls, that they think it's harmful to their reputation to even allow any of these things on their service. And under their contract, because you agree to the acceptable use application in the contract itself, under their contract, 
then you are going to be able to be found to be in breach and they're going to be able to suspend you immediately. And what happens when they can suspend you immediately? Well, if you go up to their termination clause, yes, there is exactly what Parler cites in their lawsuit. We may terminate this agreement for any reason. So for convenience on 30 days notice, and we may also terminate this agreement immediately upon notice to you for cause if we have the right to suspend under section six. So yeah, they've got that 30 days uncured kind of concept in the agreement. That's what Parler focuses on. But with section six and then section eight and then section seven, you get to a place where they are allowed to terminate the agreement immediately if they have any right to suspend you under section six, which says in black and white in the contract that Amazon can take this step. And I'm not saying that that's necessarily a good thing. I think they could take this step against virtually everybody on the internet because anything that could potentially harm Amazon's reputation is entirely within Amazon's self-determination. Harmful, illegal, whatever they want to call it, they can do it if they'd like. Now, for the most part, 90% of us are going to be protected by the fact that Amazon wants to make money. And these companies pay Amazon money to use those services, and they don't want to just be kicking off people willy-nilly. But as you can see, there are certain circumstances where the structure of these agreements, the structure of the Facebooks and the Amazons and the Twitters and the Googles of the world, the one that the House of Representatives was so concerned with really can have the effect of giving this total power to these companies because I'm going to sit here in virtual legality and tell you this isn't a breach of contract, folks. If you signed up on these terms, they got you and they can do what they like. Now I'm going to add the last bit of problem to the parlor complaint. If we scroll down a little bit further, I bet you know what is down here if you've been in virtual reality before. Not only are there limitations of liability, which hurt your ability to get, uh, to get damages, there's also an arbitration provision. Any dispute or claim relating in any way to your use of the service offerings or to any products or services sold or distributed by AWS will be adjudicated in the governing courts. If the applicable AWS contracting party is Amazon Web Services, Inc. or Amazon Web Services, Korea, the parties agree that the provisions of this section 13.5a will apply and disputes will be resolved by binding arbitration rather than in court, except that you may assert claims in small claims court if your claims qualify, which they do not for this purpose. So one of the things that you are very likely to see from Amazon, which will very likely carry the day, is court, you don't have jurisdiction here. Under the Federal Arbitration Act, they've agreed to arbitrate any claims they have here. We're going to kick it to arbitration. It's going to be completely confidential, and we won't hear about this again because Anything that is adjudicated in public like this has that chance of harming Amazon's reputation. So under the contract claim, which I thought might be strong when I read it from Parler, Parler basically gets it all wrong. And they probably have to arbitrate the complaint, period. And you can come into virtual legality and leave a comment that says, all these things should be illegal in these contract terms, shouldn't be valid and all these various things. And I can say, hey, you know what? Maybe you're right. That isn't the way that the U.S. Ju uh, jurisdiction works. That isn't the way that the legal system works uh, in uh, the federal courts or in the various states here that are applicable. You see them referencing Washington law. And so I think Parler is very unlikely to win the day on that complaint. Now, we'll try to treat with this third count a little bit more quickly. Basically, this is tortious interference with a contract or business expectancy. They say in Washington, the elements of tortious interference with a contract or expectancy are the existence of a valid contractual relationship or prospective relationship, the defendant's knowledge of that relationship. So I think they win on those. Amazon knows there's contracts that they have with Parler. They know Parler has a relationship with its customers. An intentional interference inducing or causing a breach or termination of the relationship or expectancy. Yes, they know cutting them off from the services will cause Parler to breach its agreement with its own customers, not be able to provide the service that it is otherwise contracted to provide, whatever agreements it might have with advertisers. Again, I don't know how Parler is monetized, but Amazon knows all of these things. So that's all good so far. And then the defendant's interference for an improper purpose or by improper means and resulting in damage. They might well be resulting in damage, but item four here is going to be the big problem. Parler's going to say, hey, we have all these people. Amazon knew what it was doing. Amazon intentionally interferes with Parler's current contracts and future expected customer relationships by terminating the agreement with it under the pretext that Parler was in violation of the contract when AWS knew Parler was not in violation and when Twitter was engaging in an identical conduct, but AWS did not terminate its contract with Twitter and probably not, right? We just talked about the fact that Amazon probably has those rights under its contract. One thing that we skimmed over a little bit is that Amazon has a general right to get out of this for convenience. This is something that's come up in the Apple and Epic discussions. But there's a provision here that says we may terminate this agreement for any reason by providing you at least 30 days advance notice. So the very best that Parler can hope for 
if they convince the judge of all of the rest of this stuff is basically a 30-day window. And maybe that's what Parler wants. Maybe that's what Parler needs. It's not impossible to get that out of a judge, to basically have a judge say, Amazon, what would this actually hurt you? Give them the 30 days. You could terminate it 30 days from now. Parler gets to stay up there and gets migrated and Amazon won't like it. And I think Amazon probably has the better argument here. But when we start talking about temporary restraining orders and equitable jurisdictions and equitable decisions, anything can happen. And this particular portion of the law, the reason I'm not covering it very much is this is a very equitable kind of concept. If you go and you look at Washington references to this type of stuff, you will see that they basically say, oh, well, we wind up looking at the restatement second of torts in the absence of local authority. The Washington State Supreme Court has historically relied on a restatement, a treatise that talks about these various torts and the tort in and of itself, by pulling up a Colorado example here, just because they summarize the tort pretty well, uh, isn't very useful to determining whether somebody has acted improperly, right? If you go down and you look at this, it's like, okay, it's improper if you take into account the nature of the actor's conduct, the actor's motive, the interests of the other with which the actor conduct interferes, the interests sought to be advanced, the social interests in protecting the freedom of action of the actor, the proximity or remoteness of the actor's conduct to the interference and the relations between the parties. That's not good law, right? And, and this is not just me saying this. This is something that's well known, I think, by legal academics, which is this particular tort, intentional interference uh, with business relations, contracts, or expectations for business that rely on this kind of improper definition, which is, you tell me what's improper based on a balancing of these, I think it's what, seven factors, makes it very difficult to know whether something is illegal or legal. I will say that Amazon acting under what appears to be their rights under the contract with at least a reasonable justification for saying that Twitter is doing something differently than from Parler means that Amazon is mostly going to be able to get out of these arguments. And the real silver bullet is that they can have the ability to say none of this should be in court at all. And we should ask uh, an arbitrator to arbitrate all these complaints. Which is all a long way of saying, and thank you for joining me for an hour-long episode of Virtual Legality here, that Parler, regardless of whether you think it is right or wrong, is what has happened to them this past week and what is happening to other apps and Donald Trump or whatever else, just looking at this lawsuit, it's very quickly written. It's 18 pages long. It doesn't really bring all of the things that I would expect them to bring if they were really serious about this, is unlikely to win, is very likely to get kicked out by Amazon, either directly to arbitration or just force them to dismiss it because they don't bring very good claims. And I'm sorry to say that for those of you that were invested in having another 27 long uh, series on this case. I don't expect that to happen. Uh, But I did think it was an important moment in time here in the United States. It was an important lawsuit to talk about, even though I strongly suspect YouTube won't much like me talking about it at the end of the day. This has been Virtual Legality for today. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, share, ring the bell, tell people that we are discussing things like business and law, not just of pop culture, but also of technology. And big tech is going to be in the news a lot this year. So you can expect a fair number of videos on technology, how it interacts with the new Congress, the new president, the new United States makeup. Uh, And if you're interested in any of those things, please do continue to come to the channel because I think we're going to have a lot of interesting discussions on those topics. If you watch this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.